let's continue with the nervous system. Um, we're going to talk about some things about the brain now, but not things that are about specific areas. We're going to talk more about kind of these more integrative aspects of the brain that are still useful to think about. And um, let's do that then. Let me get my little tablet here. So obviously it's nice to have um, information on what the brain is doing without having to cut someone's skull open and stick electrodes in their brain. Um, and it turns out, you know, here's somebody. Weird looking person, but here, here's their brain inside their skull. You know, all that electrical activity that's happening in their brain does create small but measurable voltage changes on the scalp. So you can take like, um, you know, like a voltage meter and you can measure little voltage changes on the scalp that are generated by kind of the sum total of all the electrical activity going on within the brain. Um, you know, and that's, and what do we call that when we measure that voltage? Electroencephalogram. Yeah, exactly. Electroencephalogram also known as EEG. Um, you know, electro, obviously it's electrical current or voltage. Um, encephalo meaning like the, the cerebral hemispheres and gram like a picture, right? Again, we have a similar thing we're gonna see when we get to the heart, the EKG or EC electrocardiogram is gonna be electrical activity we're measuring on the skin generated by the heart activity. Or when we get to EMG, it's going to be electrical activity on the skin generated by muscle, muscle depolarization. So, but for today, we're going to look at EEG. And it's clinically useful. There are EEGs that are um, normal versus abnormal. Um, it's also very useful when you're doing like sleep studies. Um, there's typical EEG patterns that happen during sleep that are useful to look at um, when people have sleep disorders. Um, you know, being clinically dead is having no EEG, the flatline EEG, if there's no electrical activity measurable from your brain. So this is used, you know, quite a bit in a clinical setting. You know, again, it's very coarse. It doesn't give you specific information about what one little section of the brain is doing versus another, but still there are typical patterns that we see. So let's, let's talk about some of these typical EEG patterns. Okay. So one is called alpha waves. Um, these tend to be if you're awake, but kind of relaxed. I guess let me use a darker. And you know, they kind of go up. They're never super pretty. But they have a um, basic frequency. Remember, we, what, what did we say? What does frequency mean? How many per second, right? Yeah, exactly. How many per second? How many? So people who are trained to analyze EEGs, 
basically kind of say, okay, it's kind of it's kind of um, irregular, but it's also kind of regular. So about how many, what kind of frequency is this at? If it's alpha waves, it's somewhere around 10 Hertz. Um, there's a range like eight to 13 Hertz. There's a darker one. So somewhere around eight to 13 Hertz. Um, it's going up and down. Again, I, like I said, it's not like this perfect sine wave or something. It's it's messier, but it still has a basic pattern of oscillating up and down around eight to 13 Hertz. Um, if you then tell somebody, start doing math in your head. You say, um, starting at 100, like subtract off seven and then subtract seven off from that and then seven from that and seven from that. And the person's like, oh my God, all right, um, 93 and then um, 80, oh my God. Well, they start like having to think, then it changes. It goes into what are called beta waves. That's a beta. So this is alert and concentrating. This is smaller and faster. Um, so. Again, so if you're kind of doing this thing, trying to figure out how many per second, it's faster. It's is usually somewhere around, um, I have here 14 to 25 Hertz. You don't have to remember the exact ranges. You should know though that alpha waves are about 10, beta waves are about double that. that you should know it kind of to that degree. Um, you know, things that are trying to entrain your brain into relaxed states will often like pulse or, you know, blink around 10 Hertz, you know, 10 per second, because that's trying to get your brain into this relaxed alpha state. Um, so you can, you can see this really clearly, even if you snap, you know, get somebody has to pay attention. We had a student who was an EEG tech in the class a while ago, and um, she did her independent research project using EEG. So we had an EEG set up in the lab and it was really fun. You could just see like somebody is just relaxing and their EEG is just kind of going up and down. And then all you do is you snap. And they're like, whoa, what was that? And all of a sudden you just see it get smaller and faster. And then after a while, if they have nothing to pay attention to, it kind of gets back into the alpha waves again. So that um, transition is, is, it's not just like something I can write about on the screen. If we had somebody hooked up to an EEG, you could just see it really easily when they're relaxed versus when they're paying attention or thinking about things to when they get back into that more relaxed state. Um, The other two um, waves are the ones that are more slow, that are found more in, in adults, you'd only find them in sleep. So let's look at those. So alpha waves and beta waves, these are gonna be in people who are awake. You know, if they're relaxed versus they're concentrating. The other ones, should not be in an awake adult. So theta waves. So these are getting much kind of bigger and slower. I'm gonna have these somewhere like three and a half to seven.
So these are starting to show up when we're going into the different stages of sleep. We'll talk about this explicitly when we get into sleep. Um, theta waves are not gonna be seen in an awake adult, but you do actually see them in an awake um, child. So one of the things that's interesting about typical EEG patterns is they change depending on your age. Like if you get one of these books to show what are typical or non-typical EEGs, it's different if you're five years old or if you're 30 years old. Um, so theta waves in a child would not be of a concern, but in an adult, they would be of a concern like in an in a awake person. So just kind of putting that out there, what's normal depends on if you're a kid or an adult. Um, the slowest are the delta waves. These are big and slow. Maybe I'll make it fatter. So here I have like somewhere around like three to four hertz. These are only found in the deepest part of sleep. or if you're in a coma. <laughs> if, you, if you see delta waves in somebody who is not in deep sleep, you really gotta worry. Um, we will get back to the delta waves again in a few moments when we talk about different stages of sleep. And again, these, these are just Greek letters. If, you're not, if, you, if you've been in math, you know an alpha, a beta, a theta, a delta. Um, so I tend to use those, but you can also just use the words. So again, theta waves and delta waves we're going to see um, during sleep, during kind of the slow wave, non-REM part of sleep. Um, beta waves, alpha waves typically are when you're awake. Although we're going to see there's parts of sleep, the REM part of sleep, where your brain actually looks like that. That's why they sometimes call it paradoxical sleep because your brain actually looks like it's awake even though you're not awake. So is this, make, is this clear what EEG is? You, know, it, you can get some information about different parts of the brain depending on where you put the electrodes. Like typically people will put a whole bunch of, especially in studies, more like um, research studies, I'll put electrodes all over the scalp. So different regions of the brain will be contributing more or less to one electrode or another. So you get some kind of regional information, but in general, you get very little um, specific information about what part of the brain is creating the um, signal because is this whole volume full of electrical activity and you're just measuring some little spots on the surface. Um, that being said, you get very good timing, temporal information um, about when signals are starting and stopping. So it, it does have a lot of value if you're trying to see like timing information about brain, brain activity, as opposed to us telling you like the fMRI um, studies where you can actually get information about what's happening in different parts of the brain itself, but your um, timing resolution is like plus or minus 10 seconds. When did it start or stop? You know, <laughs> so it's maybe not 10, but you know, on the order of seconds rather than on the order of milliseconds. So EEG. So let's... Um, Let's use this in the service of talking about sleep. Uh, so sleep, obviously you gotta sleep. Um, if you don't sleep, your brain will, actually people, people where they force them not to sleep for really long, long periods, there's, there's, it, it's really unhealthy. 
people who've tried to stay awake really, really long times have ended up having some like pretty bad outcomes. Um, what is sleep doing for you? It seems that it's useful at minimally in kind of helping kind of consolidate memories. Um, we'll talk about consolidation of memories a little more, but basically taking memories from short-term into long-term, like people who study something and get a good night's sleep are much more likely to retain that information than people who don't get a good night's sleep. You know, it's part of the reason why, even when you're in college particularly, you might think like, if I just never sleep and just study constantly, I'll do better in my classes. You know, that's, that's, there's a point of diminishing returns where if you're not actually getting sleep, the stuff that you're studying isn't sticking as well. So, you know, you've got like, you've got a rationale for giving yourself permission to sleep because <laughs> you're gonna, you don't wanna oversleep, but you know, giving your, don't, don't undersleep. Um, the other things about sleep, there seems to be some kind of flushing out of just the interstitial space between the cells during sleep. During sleep, there's kind of a slow bulk flow of extracellular fluid through the neural tissue that seems to kind of keep, kind of refresh, refresh the extracellular fluid around your neural tissues. Um, okay, when we get to the um, lymphatic system, we'll talk about the system in most of your tissues that's kind of filtering out the interstitial fluids and returning the fluid back into your circulatory system and all that, but that doesn't exist in your brain. So in your brain, there's now what they call like, what do they call it? The glymphatic system. But during sleep, there seems to actually be some just kind of maintenance of the kind of extracellular environment in your brain. Um, sleep is got two really different um, modes. Like when you're asleep, there's two really different um, things that you go through. So let's talk about what are the two, two different types of sleep. So there is non-REM or like slow wave and REM, which stands for rapid eye movement. So during the course of the night, you alternate, you go back and forth between these two. Um, actually, num a, a variety of times. We'll, we'll, I'll show you some little sleep sleepograms or whatever, or hypnograms a little later. Um, but you'll start in slow wave, you'll go into REM and then back into slow wave and back into REM and back into slow wave and back into REM. Um, so let's let's start with the slow wave part because it's probably the one that's kind of easier to understand. This is where everything slows down. You know, you start out. You know, obviously before you before you fall asleep, you're going to kind of be an alpha wave. You're going to have to be relaxed. You're not going to fall asleep if you're like trying to do math in your head. Um, the way you know somebody is starting to fall asleep, so this is like before. Um, the way you know somebody is falling asleep rather than just really relaxed is you start getting these large bursts of electrical activity in the EEG. It's called, they call them sleep spindles. So these signify the onset of, of sleep versus just being relaxed. Again, this, this woman who was doing that research project I was telling you about, um, she would have her subjects lying there and with blindfolds on and listening to different things. And she could tell were they still awake 
and responding to the stimulus or were they actually just falling asleep on her by noticing that her sleep spindles coming so she would know that they're nodding off rather than just lying there looking relaxed so it's hard to tell just looking at somebody like just phys- lying there physically but if you're looking at their brain waves you actually can tell if they're asleep versus just really relaxed um, this then transitions into the slow wave And the theta and the delta, those really big. So, and this is kind of the deepest part of sleep. So the slowest wave, the deepest sleep is in the, when those delta waves are there. Um, And you don't always go all the way down to the slowest level. You might go down, slow down, but not get to the slowest level. You might go down and come back up or go down and up and back down. So it's, it's a little nonlinear. I'll, I'll show you again some, some pictures of what it looks like in real life. So while this is happening, um, your body is slowing down as well. Um, Maybe let me give myself a, I realize I need to give myself some more room here. So I'm in non-REM. Okay, your heart rate is slowing down. Your temperature goes down. Um, you know, your body doesn't move because there's no brain activity to operate your muscles. Um, there is some uh, movement, like maybe every 15 minutes, there's kind of a repositioning so you don't get bed sores. So there is, there is kind of an automatic repositioning of your body every, every 10 or 15 minutes to kind of make sure you're not like cutting off circulation to a part of your body, um, right? If you, if I, um, what do they call it? Saturday night palsy. Like people, one of the dangers of getting super, super drunk before you go to bed is you can like be so kind of anesthetized that you don't shift. And then people wake up and they actually have caused nerve damage and part of their body doesn't work anymore because Right. Normally, if you like fall asleep on something, it's like, ooh, that's weird. It's like it's pins and needles and then it comes back. But there are cases of people, particularly people who go to bed super, super drunk, where they wake up with actual nerve damage because they did not do the little shifting to keep the blood flow to their, to their limbs as they're as they're sleeping. So reasons not to get super, super, super trash before you go to bed. Um, so rapid eye movement. This is the other part of sleep. And it's sometimes called paradoxical sleep. Um, because there's lots of things about it that don't really seem like you're asleep your brain waves look more like awake. You know, alpha and beta. So your brain is really active and doing stuff. Um, heart rate is going up. Temperature is going up. Blood pressure goes up. Um, obviously, if your brain is totally active, you need to disconnect your brain from your musculoskeletal system or else you are going to like run around and do stuff. Whatever your brain is doing is going to be controlling your body. 
So your muscles, your skeletal muscles are paralyzed. except your eye, the, the muscles that operate your eyes um, to move your extrinsic eye muscles that move them around, like, so you can like, so I'd say except eye and middle ear muscles. So the reason it's called rapid eye movement sleep is your eyes do zip around, you know, look around, flick up, up and down. Um, there have been studies where people have looked at like lucid dreaming and they'll have people go, you know, you, you can train yourself to actually become aware, like realize, wait, I'm dreaming. It's actually, it's, it's cool. Um, and so then once they're in the lucid dream, they remember they're supposed to do a little pattern with their eyes flick like three times to the left and then up and down or whatever. And they've, they've seen that in the body that's just lying there asleep, the eyes actually are doing what you're doing in your dream. So like when you're looking around in your dream, um, it's very likely that your eyes and your physical body lying there in bed are actually following doing whatever you're doing in your dream, which is kind of cool. Um, this is where most dreams occur here. Is there a reason why our uh, eyes flicker like that? Um, a reason. Um, I mean, what the reason on a pract on a um, on a level of just the physiology is those muscles aren't paralyzed. So as your brain sends out messages about moving your eyes, the eyes follow. But, you know, evolutionarily, why your eyes would flicker, I have no idea. I think it's very likely is a lot of things come along for the ride. Like if it's not evolutionarily disadvantageous, like it's, dis it's a disadvantage to have your overall body respond to your brain activity in dreams. In fact, there are these sleep disorders. I, I went to a talk once by a guy who works with sleep disorders and he had all these stories, like guy who would wake up, not wake, he wouldn't wake up. In his dream, he would dream that he was protecting his wife from some attacker. And in reality, he's like pounding and punching his wife who's actually lying next to him in bed. But in his dream, he's beating up this attacker, <laughs> you know, so you don't want to act out your dreams. Other people have got out of bed and jumped out of windows and things like that, you know, in some action dream doing something. And if their body is not paralyzed, um, it can be bad. Um, is that where, is this where sleepwalking occurs? So that's a little different. So sleepwalking and night terrors and things, that actually seems to be more in the slow wave. Because sleepwalking is more unconscious. Like people who are sleepwalking are more like in a zombie state. They're not, they don't even know they're doing anything. What I was talking about, people actually feel like they're having some experience and their body is moving, but it's just their body is not where they think it is. <laughs> their body is actually in bed rather than like kind of on the streets of their dream. Um, would like um, sleep paralysis be in that in REM sleep? You know, like when people wake up and they can't move their bodies, but they can move their eyes. Yeah, so that like that weird. Sometimes people get that experience where you wake up and it's really freaky. It's like you can't move. It's if there's a little delay between when your body comes back online, even though you're kind of waking up, you're, in fact, sometimes people get these weird feelings. They think like there's an elephant, like some monster sitting on their chest or something, because I can't breathe. When in fact, they just can't voluntarily gasp because they're still coming back online in terms of voluntary motor control. So they feel like, you know, they can't move and they're 
yeah so yeah that that can happen where where you start becoming conscious and yet your muscles aren't aren't back online um sleepwalking and there's even sleep eating there have been cases of people who aren't losing weight even though they're doing all these <laughs> they're doing everything right and they put in like a camera and they'll realize that in the middle of the night they just get up and walk to the cupboard and and just kind of like go back to bed and they they have no memories or nothing about it um so there is this weird unconscious thing that can happen and i think sleepwalking tends to be more in that as opposed to you know that happens to be in this non rem like if you've ever woke if you wake up from rem sleep you know you're you're pretty much awake you know what's going on if you've ever been like roused from here it's like i've i've kind of been aroused where there's like i don't even know how to talk um, it takes a little while to like kind of remember how to function because your brain is kind of turned off. Um, so REM, your EEG looks like it's awake, heart rate, temperature, blood pressure are going up, skeletal muscles are paralyzed so you don't actually act out your dreams. Most dreams do occur here. There is some, you know, it seems some dreams do occur in the non-REM, but it's not as common. Um, other thing in REM that's actually clinically relevant is spontaneous erections happen in, in REM. So in a guy, during the course of the night, um, you know, the penis will engorge with blood. And it seems, you know, partly it's just kind of a built-in thing to kind of, you know, kind of keep the system operating. Um, but it's used in a, in a diagnostic way if somebody has like erectile dysfunction and they're trying to figure out, is it more psychological or physiological? they can put a little strip of paper around the base of the penis before he goes to bed and see if that little strip of paper has been broken in the morning because of one of these spontaneous erections kind of swelling things up and splitting the little the little strip of paper so spontaneous erections in rem um what else about rem let me let me show you a little picture just of what the course of the night tends to look like. Um, da, da, da. Share screen. So this is kind of a, a typical kind of electroencephalogram trace during the course of the night for somebody. And like I was saying, there's these stage, you know, it, it, depending on what you're reading, they'll give the different stages of slow wave sleep, slow wave sleep different names. Um, the basic idea though is as you go into the deeper parts of slow wave sleep, the EEG waves are getting slower. So this is saying this person's awake. They're starting here in this kind of slow, getting even slower, going down into the slowest, which are the delta waves. Then they're kind of coming back up. And then they go into this REM sleep. This is this, again, very different kind of thing. All of a sudden, their EEG looks like it's awake. But then we're done. Now it's slowing down. We're getting into the slow wave again, down into the delta wave again, the slowest. This is what they often call kind of like the restored, real restorative sleep. Um, 
then it's kind of speeding up again. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 we're in REM sleep again. And then we're kind of going back into slow way, but here it doesn't go as slow. You know, it never gets down into the, the real slowest delta wave, comes back up. Now we're in REM again. Now we're kind of back into slow, but never get that slow and back into REM again. And now they're awake. You know, so it's it goes back and forth over the course of the night like this. You know, exactly how much time you spend in these different um, phases often depends on just your activity. Um, people who haven't been getting enough REM sleep will get like REM rebound, where they'll get lots of REM. They'll kind of fall asleep and directly go into lots of REM sleep. Um, one of the things that you need to kind of be concerned about when you, you know, prescribe drugs to help people sleep is if you give them a drug that is just about kind of sedating their brain, then they don't actually get normal sleep because normal sleep actually includes these REM phases, which are actually very active. So there are different drugs. I, th I think like Ambien is one of the ones that will knock you out, but not suppress a more normal like sleep cycle. So, but if you are kind of consistently taking drugs to fall asleep that are suppressing the um, like REM phases because it's just kind of um, inhibiting most brain activity, that's actually not going to be a good thing because you're going to start um, you're going to start having this imbalance of the different phases of sleep. Um, I should also say, as you get older you spend less and less time in these slowest levels of deep wave delta sleep, um, which is part of the reason I think, you know, older people tend to take naps. The classic thing like old people take naps. If you're not actually getting that deep wave restorative sleep in the middle of the night, you know, you're not gonna be as rested and restored, you know, for the rest of the day. So, Having having um, this deep wave restorative sleep seems to be important for really feeling rested. Um, the amount of REM you spend, again, depends on a variety of things. Age, little kids need a lot more REM. Like babies spend tons of time in REM. Almost the moment they fall asleep, their eyes start flicking around. Um, so, these are the different phases of sleep. Again, for sleep studies, like if you're having problems or trying to figure out what's going on with you, they will hook up your head with a bunch of electrodes and take a look. What are you doing? Do you seem to be going through these different stages? Like people who have sleep apnea, for instance, where they stop breathing when they fall asleep. You can see that as soon as things start, they go up again. Like there are people who don't realize, they don't realize like, why am I always tired? Well, how come I, I just feel kind of depressed all the time and I never feel like, okay. And they put them in a sleep study like this and they realize that they're just waking up 300 times a night because every time they're starting to go into the stages of sleep, they get pushed back out because they're starting to gasp because they can't breathe. Um, so like sleep apnea, that thing where you don't breathe as you start falling asleep is it can be like a super debilitating condition because you don't ever get rested. Um, How does um, alcohol affect sleep cycles or sleep stages? So I think it's probably going to be one of the, I don't know if you know, I should look it up more. My assumption is it's going to be more sedating, kind of make it harder to get into a more normal pattern because um, it's a it's a depressant, but I I don't know I don't know enough about that. Um, so different parts of sleep. Any questions about any of that? I should mention one of the things that's kind of funny about like dreams. 
Um, I'll just mention this as an aside, you know, because I think in, you know, just in our language, dreamy sounds like really good. You know, it's like, oh, he's so dreamy. Or like my my dream job, or um, oh that you know oh, in my dreams you know ever, um, but when people have like actually studied dreams, they typically aren't so fun. Um, there's this guy Calvin Hall. He studied. Um, he had like people record like ten thousand dreams. Uh, had all his, his grad students basically go over and rate them based on their content. And I have, where I have it here, it's here, it was over two thirds, 64% were sad, apprehensive, or angry. Um, only like 18%, like 20, less than, less than a fifth were happy or exciting. Um, so, they seem to be places where maybe people are working out stresses or trying to figure stuff out, but they're not necessarily a respite from the stress of the real world. So if your dreams are not, are not fun, don't think that you're kind of weird and everybody else is like romping around with the lover of their dreams or something in their head at night. Um, so, you know, the function of dreams is kind of tricky. It's people have tried to look at them. Um, I won't go there. Um, but there is something about sleep that also seems to be about like setting memories that are important to keep and also letting go of stuff you don't need to keep, right? Think about how much information is coming in every day. And you have to kind of sift through what are you going to, you know, there's, there's some limited amount of capacity to memory, to, to store things. So like, what are you letting go of? What are you holding on to? That seems to be part of sleep as well. Kind of like housekeeping in terms of all your experiences and memories. And, but yeah, sleep, we could, you know, there's so much to talk about sleep. It's actually, it's fascinating that the pace, the places in between awake and asleep are also super fun. Um, is hypnagogia, hypnopompia. This is right before you fall asleep. This is right as you're waking up. Um, if you try as much as possible to kind of stay conscious in that space, um, it gets really weird. Um, you start getting really crazy imagery and thoughts. Um, there's been a lot of artists that have worked in that space. Um, who I've, actually, and scientists. There's been both, both artists and scientists. I think it was Dolly. I'm trying to think. One of the, there's one guy that would like sit in his chair and like hold a metal ball on that verge of falling asleep. So every time he would just kind of start to lose consciousness, the ball would fall and he, so he just kind of try to surf right on that edge of awake and asleep. And there's been scientists as well that have done that because they've just found it a very interesting place, like an altered state of consciousness that you can go into where your thought processes get all kind of different, but often like kind of interesting stuff you can pull back from there. So I'll put that out there that not necessarily into dreams, but just into those weird spaces in between awake and asleep are, are fascinating to look at sometimes. I think sometimes when people say dreamy, I know in my case, like one of the best mental states ever is especially that second one when you're like, well, actually on either side of it, when you're either awake but not fully awake or you're on your way to sleep and you know there's no pulling back you got nothing that's keeping you up I'll, i will honestly try and like prolong that state as long as possible because it is such a good feeling right so um, that that's also it depends on your like i can say i've had very personal experience with people who that place is the most horrible horrible place because of PTSD where 
that losing vigilance is just a place to scream and kick because that's that's the moment where you are not safe anymore so i think yeah it's it depends on the person whether or not that place is is a good place or not so um yeah so we'll in fact and we'll talk about we're going to talk about memory mem you know part of ptsd is this like memories become so normally memories are kind of a um, diminished experience of what happened like you can remember it but you know that you're not experiencing it again in the moment it's just like remembering something that happened in the past whereas you know in some so for some people memories get wired in in a way where you you lose track of whether or not you're just in something that happened versus something that's happening again um so sleep all right we're gonna now move to memories so we just talked about memories let's talk about memories nine a.m so memory you know memory is another one of these things that's fascinating to look at and we're learning more and more about um, you know, how memories are even stored in your head is still like, it's not so clear. It's pretty clear that they're distributed. Like when you are remembering something, you're kind of reactivating many parts of your brain that were active in the actual kind of experience. Um, you know, you can actually have damage to your um, visual cortex that will erase the visual components of a memory but leave all the other aspects of a memory intact so it, there's obviously some way that you're kind of reactivating the brain to kind of what was it like to have that but then not in some way that feels as real you kind of know like oh that's kind of a just an, an old memory trace of that rather than i'm it's my experience in the moment um memory you know at its simplest level is like conditioning even like you know when i was talking about kind of conditioned reflexes like when people have tried to look at the physiological basis of memory that's where they start like just how does basic conditioning happen how do you actually um like learn to like have some response to something that you didn't have a response to before and what people have found starting from those studies and now up to these more kind of complicated studies is that there's actually like physical processes involved in setting long-term memories. So let's talk about this short-term memory versus long-term memory. So short-term memory when you're first remembering something or experiencing something it seems to exist in this more temporary form that seems to be more about just kind of electrical reverberations in your brain circuits like if you take somebody and you give them electroconvulsive therapy ec electroshock you put a big voltage across their their brain um, everything that they've experienced for the last 15 minutes is going to be erased. But stuff that happened like an hour ago or longer, that's all fine. You know, so long-term memories are something much more physical about how they are stored as opposed to short-term memories, which are much more temporary. So there's this process of moving things from short-term into long-term, and they call that consolidation. Consolidation is this process of taking these short-term memories and transferring them into long-term. Um, there's a few things we know about this process now that are important. One is it involves the hippocampus. The 
We talked about the hippocampus, um, that little area of gray matter in the temporal lobes. Um, Oliver Sacks is a neurologist and author. If you haven't read his stuff, you should read everything he's written. He's great. <laughs> um, but he, he wrote about a, a guy who had bilateral hippocampal damage, you know, and he could not form any new memories. Like he still, even though he was like, I think in his 40s or 50s, he still had memories of when he was, I think like 18 or something and just getting out of, you getting into the Navy or something. Um, you know, he'd meet new people and, or meet, he'd meet somebody and it would be like he'd met them the first time and he'd get to know them, they'd have a nice conversation, but if he met them again, like later in the day, it would be like he met them for the first time again. Like he could have short-term memories, but after about an hour, everything was just evaporating behind him. Um, so hippocampus is necessary to have this consolidation happening, create long-term memories from your short-term memories. Kind of like that guy in Memento, in that movie, that Chris, Chris Nolan movie. Um, you know, that movie, you know, there are people like that who cannot make new memories. Um, the other thing people have found about this consolidation is that it involves protein synthesis. Right. There's something physical that happens um, where you are kind of adjusting the weights of synapses and doing different things. So what they've they've done these experiments that are, you know, where you can actually block consolidation by giving, you know, usually not people, but giving like animals um, drugs that block protein synthesis and they can't form new memories. So, so that's an interesting thing. And this is going to come back in just a second. So the other thing that people have been learning about memory that is really kind of fascinating is when you remember things, like putting something in the long-term memory it's not like you put it into a filing cabinet then you, that, that you then peek into to see what's there. If you have something in long-term memory and you wanna use it again in an active way, you have to pull it back into your short-term memory, your working memory. So it gets kind of pulled back into here if you're actually using that memory, but then it gets reconsolidated. It kind of gets put back into the long-term memory after you've been working with it. And there's a couple of, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of experiments that I think are really use, worth, worth thinking about. Because um, if things happen in short-term memory that contaminate that memory, it can actually mutate the memory. Like there was one study where they, would interview people about their experiences as a kid at Disneyland. And the experimenters would, you know, on purpose kind of suggest these, you know, experiences of being with this person in a Bugs Bunny suit that they were, you know, interacting with when they were at the park. You know, and after these exper after these interviews, you know, a number of these people had these kind of vivid memories of being kids and having some experience with someone in a Bugs Bunny suit, you know, which could not exist at Disneyland since he's a Warner Brothers character. He would never be, there would never be someone in a Bugs Bunny suit at Disneyland. But they were able to actually kind of contaminate the memories by this process of bringing it into short term, messing with it, putting it back in. Um, other things, there was a rat experiment that was really cool. Um, where they would teach these rats these different mazes. And then they would have them do the maze. And when they do the maze, they have to like remember it. But then for some of the rats, 
they would give them these drugs that block protein synthesis and therefore block this reconsolidation. And when the rats would do the maze, they would, they, it would erase, erase their memory of the maze. So you'd have like, you know, you know, group A rat and group B. And there's maze one, maze two. And group, group A, they both learn the maze one and maze two, um, except group B gets these, pro, um, so what is it? So group A does the maze, and they remember the maze. Group B does maze one and they remember maze one, still they can do it again. Group A does maze two, they can do it and remember it. Group B does maze two, but they get these protein blockers, protein synthesis blockers. And they do the maze, but then they forget it. It gets erased from their memory. So the implications, not just the implications, it's the reality of it is by bringing these memories in and blocking reconsolidation, you can erase, erase stuff from memory. Um, people have been working with this and trying to kind of attenuate, you know, traumatic memories and stuff like that. Um, there's, there's, this gets more complicated, even levels of cortisol stress hormones affects how much um, memories get mutated and stuff like that. But this is this is one of these things. This also gets into like kind of the ethics of, of um, even if we do have the ability to take this into a more practical way, like how much is it good to, you know, because we are the sum of our memories and experiences at some level, like is it good thing or who knows? But if there are very debilitating memories, sometimes it's actually not a, such a, you know, a lot of these, again, just, um, things for PTSD have to do with trying to take memories that are too vivid and trying to, um, trying to attenuate them so they aren't as debilitating. So um, this, this is still things people are, still something people are looking at, looking at different ways to navigate how to do this in a way that might be useful versus um, not, but I think this idea of reconsolidation is useful too. Um, if you've ever been, if you've ever been on a jury, you've probably noticed it's bizarre how many different first person accounts there are of the exact same moment. <laughs> everybody, you know, everybody who is telling you exactly what they saw has a slightly different version. And partly it's kind of taking it in. And I think partly it's every time you remember things, things get kind of mutated. It's a, it's a little bit of a, I, don't, I find it a little bit disconcerting to realize that your long-term memory is a little malleable. Um, so this, you know, you've probably even noticed it. You've kind of gone back and looked at like some old picture and it's look, wait a second. Oh, that's what it was like. I kind of remembered a little differently. Um, so, but I think it's, it's worth remembering that long-term memory is, you know, is a bit of a moving target. Um, okay. So memory. So while we're here, another thing that's kind of related to memory is learning. So we can do this memory or learning. Right, learning is just, and let's talk about declarative, also known as explicit, versus Sometimes I call this procedural, your book, what is your book? Your book has a different name for it, which I don't usually use, but I'll write it here just because your book says it. Um, what does your book say? They're calling it reflexive. 
um, also known as implicit. So this is worth, worth, worth um, knowing this distinction. Um, declarative gets its name because it's stuff you can declare. Like I know that the visual cortex is located in the occipital lobe of the brain. Again, explicit, because I have explicit knowledge of what I know. I know that the visual cortex is in the occipital lobe of the brain. You know, I know my name is David. I know that this class starts at 8, 10 a.m. You know, all these kind of things, declarative, procedural or implicit. This is stuff where you are learning and you are gaining information that actually does affect your choices and decision making, but it's not something that you def that you can say that you know or why you know it. Um, there are all these studies where they'll like there'll be a training period. You know, an example of one of these studies is like, here is a picture, and is this picture yes or no? And it's, you know, there's a training and they'll say, oh, this is yes. Um, you know, this is no, this one is yes, this one's no. And people are like looking at these, it's like, I don't see any pattern. I don't know what's going on here, but you just keep getting trained, but you never actually understand what the rule is. But there's something in your nervous system that actually is paying attention and is starting to learn and notice. And so then there's like a testing thing and they'll say, all right, here, here's this picture. Is this, does this have the quality? It's like, I don't know. I never figured out what this is. It's like, guess. So people will just start randomly guessing. Okay, that's a yes. Okay, um, that's a no, I don't know. But they actually will be guessing over better than chance. Um, you know, there will be some rule, like maybe the rule will be there's higher density of dots on the right versus on the left. So this is a yes, because there's more dots on this side versus this side, but the person never actually figured it out. They can't tell you why they know that this is a yes. They just know it's like some, well, I don't know, I'm going to just, you know. So it's kind of this facet, when I think about things like intuition, you know, that's what I usually think about is this idea of your, this implicit learning, you actually are learning things, you're noticing patterns. Um, but one of the really cool things that this Oliver Sacks guy did with this patient who couldn't form new memories, it turns out there's, um, seems like there's different pathways. Declarative and this explicit and implicit learning have different pathways in the brain. So you can not have this, but still not mess with, but you can mess with forming explicit memories. Like this guy couldn't remember that he'd ever seen somebody before, but he could remember things that affected his behavior. So like they had this one study where this guy, obviously he couldn't live on his own. This guy who couldn't make new memories lived in a, um, in a psych, in a, in a hospital, a mental hospital, mental, whatever you call it, a, a psychiatric hospital. Um, and they had this thing where every morning they would give him a choice. They'd say, okay, we need you to go with Dr. A or Dr. B, um, to, to do some test. And it would always be the same two doctors, although he didn't know that for him, it was always two brand new people. And whenever he picked Dr. A, Dr. A would be really nice to him. Whenever he picked Dr. B, Dr. B would be kind of a jerk and not nice to him. Um, and over, you know, and initially it was kind of random. Actually, I think in the, initially it was more, I think they, they made the, the mean doctor a um, kind of more of an attractive woman. So he was more likely to pick her. Um, but eventually he started avoiding the mean person and would always just pick the nice person. But he had no reason, no reason why he was doing it other than, I don't know, if I have to pick one, I'll pick one. Um, but, you know, eventually there was this implicit learning. He 
did not have any explicit memory that one person or the other person he'd ever even seen before, but at some internal or I guess reflexive level, he had a um, information that he was using to make a choice. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about these two levels of learning that happen, this implicit versus explicit. Um, so that's, yeah, that's. Yeah, Would you, I'm sorry. Would you say that it's the declarative explicit is like the conscious learning? Yeah, it's kind it's of in more your like in, in the in the kind of in the more um, kind of professional coaching. It's the stuff you know you know, you know, versus the stuff you don't know you know. Right. This is kind of the stuff you don't know you know. You actually do know stuff, but you're not actually consciously aware that you know it. And then you can go, if you're going to take the analogy, there's the stuff you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um, but anyway, the, um, the, yeah, the one thing in Memento that's kind of weird is they show that he doesn't seem to have the implicit learning as well, whereas the cases I've seen about people who like have the at least hippocampal damage, they lose this, but they still have this. Um, so, so that's that. You know, there's so much more um, we can talk about, but we we just don't really have, um, we don't have time. I mean, I'll mention one more thing just about um, kind of brain injuries. Um, you know, because you kind of create your reality using your brain, if there is brain um, injury, Sometimes people don't have a sense that their version of reality is weird. Like somebody on the outside is like, whoa, this person is being really weird. But to them, since they are kind of constructing their own reality using their own brain, it's all internally consistent. So you'll have people who have damage to one hemisphere, particularly like a visual, you know, half of their visual um, cortex isn't working and it's just half of their visual world isn't working, but they don't know it. So like, if you tell them like, like describe what it's like walking, you know, I don't know, let's say half of the, one half of the room has shelves with books and the other half of the room has like, I don't know, skeletons because they're in a, they're in a, anatomy lab and you tell them, describe what it's like walking through this room from this side of the room to the side with here. And they'll say, oh yeah, it's, it's got all these shelves full of books. Anything else? Um, no. Okay, now imagine you're walking down the room but you're walking this way. And it's like, what do you see? Oh, there's like a bunch of skeletons on the side of the room. Anything else? No. It's like, they're just memory or version of what and it's not weird to them it's just their reality you tell them to draw a picture of a clock and they'll put all the numbers just on one side of the clock face you know and they don't know that that's weird they just don't the other side of the world doesn't exist for them the other visual field um, you have people who have damage um sometimes to their proprioception, like the sense of their body. And they are convinced that this arm is not theirs because you know the, the normal feedback in interoception that would tell them that, oh, this is my arm, isn't there. And they literally will assume that some by some weirdness in the middle of the night, they someone cut off their arm and sutured on some other arm, like some Frankenstein surgery or something, but this is not my arm. People will fall out of bed because they're trying to push this weird thing out of bed because it's freaking them out, even though it's their own arm that they're like pushing out of bed and they fall on the floor. Um, you know, people get weird things if their like autonomic functioning goes off where they don't have the, the same kind of just kind of 
you know, charge of feeling things. Like they'll see somebody that they know. And normally you see somebody and you get this kind of feeling of like, oh, familiarity and excitement, but they don't feel that. So this person must be an imposter. It's like, this looks exactly like my mom and sounds exactly like my mom, but I know it's not my mom. This is just freaky. I don't know why someone's, this person's posing as my mom, but this is not my mom, you know? And, but they're on the phone where they don't have those same clues and it's just like on the phone, then it's like, oh, hi mom. It's, it, you get all sorts of weird stuff um, where people have all sorts of different um, symptoms but then they're not aware that they have these symptoms. So I'll just put that out there. One of the strange things about these, these different um, um, brain, brain pathologies is often people actually don't have awareness of their own, of their own things. Um, what else? Okay. All right, so for the last few moments here, um, let's just introduce the peripheral nervous system, since that's what we're gonna be doing to finish up this unit. Again, what are the two main, two main components of peripheral nervous system? Sensory and motor. The sensory and motor. Also known as afferent and efferent. Um, we're gonna start by looking at the motor since it's going to be a little simpler. Um, and then we'll finish up by looking at the sensory, although we'll, we'll start introducing the sensory in, um, well, actually, well, duh, actually, you know, normally I do motor first and then sensory, but we'll, we'll start with sensory because that will be a good intro to our lab today. So let's start with sensory. Um, obviously, if you're gonna get information into the nervous system, you know, so there's, there's information, there's stimuli that are gonna be external and internal. Right, some of the stimuli that we wanna like notice are things like in our visual field or smells or touch or sounds. So a lot of them are internal. What is our blood pressure or our sugar levels in our blood right now or things like that or how stretched out is our stomach, you know? So we're gonna have Internal and external. The internal is also going to include all the proprioception, like what are the angle of our joints and the stretch of our muscles and things like that, so we can control our bodies. Um, in all of these cases, you need some kind of receptor. Receptors are the things that will take whatever that stimulus is and convert it into some kind of electrical signal that goes into your nervous system, right? Your brain only understands action potentials and stuff. So there's this idea, these receptors do what we call sensory transduction. Just basically convert some stimulus into electrical signal for the nervous system. This is an important concept. I'm gonna, in fact, I'll put it in red because that way you know it's important. In fact, I'll do it in 
the fattest possible red. Sensory transduction. We're gonna be looking at lots of different kinds of receptors and how they do their job of converting a stimulus into some electrical signal. Super complicated stuff like your eyeball that converts light ultimately into electrical signals um, that go down your optic nerve and into your brain. Very simple ones like the touch receptors in your fingers that just detect some stretch of your skin and turn it into an electrical signal that goes to your brain and you perceive as touch. Um, but in all cases, you've got to do this sensory transduction, right? If you don't have a receptor, then you don't have any way to know that that stimulus exists, right? There's lots of energies in the world that we don't have any awareness of, right? There's radio waves going through the room right now. Um, you don't have any way unless you have, if you have an actual radio with the little electronics that can detect those waves and give you some readout on whatever they're doing, the, then you know there's radio waves. But if you are just using the receptors that you are got in your body, you've got no way. You know, and you're also limited by just the range of, so when we talk about receptors, we talk about different sensory modalities. Let me write that better. Like what are the different types of things that you actually can sense? You know, what are the different kinds of things you can sense? Smell. So smell, smell, what exactly is smell? Smell is a, a um, example of something more general. What does it mean to smell? What is the stimulus for smell? It'll trace amounts of airborne chemicals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is what we'd call chemoreception. Chemo Smell is just detecting different molecules in the air. Just like taste is detecting different kinds of molecules in your saliva. You know, inside your body, you've also got lots of chemoreception. What kind of food is in your intestine and is it done breaking down yet? What's the pH of my blood right now? What's my level of blood sugar? Um, there's lots of chemoreception inside as well as outside. What are other sensory modalities, other kind of stimuli we can detect? Touch. Light, so light photo, photo reception. So we, we can detect light. Somebody else said, was it Jen? Somebody said something. I said touch, like. Touch. So touch. And touch is an example of something more gen gen general as well. Um, we call mechanoreception. Some like physical deformation, physical bending or stretching. So touching, touch is some physical bending or stretching of your skin. Um, but mechanoreception is also going to include hearing, actually. It's just the vibration of your eardrum. Mechanoreception is going to be the angle of your joints and things like that. You know, the stretch of your muscles. When we saw that stretch receptor in your muscle for the stretch reflex, that's a mechanoreceptor as well. Thermoreception? There's thermoreception. You know, the guy who just won the Nobel Prize was actually. Um, was the one he got it for trying to figure out what exactly are these receptors and how do they work? What are the channels that seem to be opening and closing in response to heat and cold? You know, and was very clever about it. Like, cause some of those receptors also respond to some chemicals as well as temperature, like um, capsaicin, like, you know, hot pepper stuff can turn on these things that also respond to heat. Um, Menthol can turn on these things that also respond to cold. 
Um, so some of these things that respond to temperature can actually respond to different chemicals as well. So thermal reception, what other kind of receptors do we got? Taste. So taste would be here under chemoreception because taste is just different chemicals in your saliva. Is it a sugar molecule or a alkaloid or something? Would that proprioceptive input be one here? Right, so I would say, you know, I'm going to put it here, proprioception. I'll put it here as a separate thing because sometimes people do put it as a separate modality, but I, I tend to just consider it as a subset of mechanoreception because ultimately all those things that are detecting your body position are mechanoreceptors. Um, so we'll, we'll look at some of those in more detail in a little bit. The other one I'll put here is nociception. Which is pain. Um, which are their own brand of receptors. So what is the stimulus for a pain receptor? You know, it's easy to, you know, stimulus for a temperature receptor is change in temperature. Stimulus for a chemoreceptor is a chemical. What is the thing that actually stimulates a pain receptor to turn on? Think about just in life, in your life experience, what kind of things are happening when you experience some physical pain? Some kind of tissue damage. Yeah, exactly. Tissue damage. So these get turned on. There's different things that can happen during tissue damage that will turn these on. So tissue damage or, you know, or like imminent. Even if the tissue is not damaged yet, the system is worried that something bad's going to happen. Almost any receptor, if driven far out, you know, beyond its normal range, will be um, perceived as pain. Like the sounds that are too loud are no longer just really loud, they're painful. Like, you know, things like that. Light that's too bright isn't just too bright, it's painful. Um, so, no C-ception, pain. Um, so you have different modalities for receptors. You also have kind of, you know, ranges that they will respond to, right? For like, you know, a touch receptor or for a light receptor, you know, there is some light that's the dimmest. We talked about the sensory, those perceptual thresholds. If something is below that perceptual threshold, even if there is a very dim light, you can't see it even though maybe your cat can see it. Or let's say there's a frequency that's really high. Beyond, we're gonna talk about human hearing goes up to about 15, max 16, 17 kilohertz. If it's higher frequency than that, you can't hear it. But your cat sure can. Your cat goes up to like 50, 50 um, kilohertz. So there's some mice that are chattering in the wall and they're freaking going crazy thinking like, oh my God, there's like all these mice around and you have no idea because you don't hear the ultrasonic chattering of the mice. Um, so, you know, your ability to sense the world is limited both by what kind of modalities your receptors can actually detect and the kind of limited ranges that those receptors can detect within those modalities. You know, anything else that exists in the universe that is either a different modality or outside the range of your receptors doesn't really exist for you, which is, it's a little, it's a little um, interesting to think about. And like, I think I've mentioned, I'll mention again, like there's something very fascinating about just the way we construct our reality is we have these receptors inside and on the very surface of our body with these very limited modalities, with limited ranges. And we take that information and inside our brain kind of, it is like the matrix, kind of create a 
virtual reality, a model of what must exist in the whole world out there that has resulted in this pattern of sensory activity on the surface of our body. Um, but as we'll see with all sorts of cool illusions and stuff, it's pretty easy to fool the system. As well. <laughs> you know, it, it makes lots, it's, it's really good for not getting hit by a car, but it's also got imperfections as well in terms of how you take in this information and construct everything. So we'll, we'll talk more about that later.